Now, I really believe that uh, more and more we are becoming family. Amen? And uh, with the family, you just hang with each other no matter what. You know what I'm talking about? There's a great scripture in the book of Romans that talks about you rejoice with those who rejoice and you mourn with those who mourn. Now, yesterday we had a basketball game. And uh, I, need, I need to bring before you some names of some, some people that are in mourning right now. There's Nick Bordieri. Michael Williamson. I'm just happy he's at church today. Matt Sullivan. Ron Harding. Andrew Smelly. I'm thankful he's doing the communion so he remembers about Jesus. You say, well, how are you feeling, Kip? Well, how about Lance? How he doing? And how about Kyle Bethalemu? Is he doing okay? Well, how about Rob Hamlin and Gary Wolfolk? Oh, we're doing fine. You just need to rejoice with us. You see what we're talking about right here? Now, I've heard there's some rumors out there that the teams were stacked. Now, hold it. Now, hold it. We need to, this is, we, we, we need to get the truth on out right here. They're saying that the team was stacked because we put Lance on that team. Now, Lance is 47 years old. I'm 52. Now, I have to admit, we probably did exploit the other team's youth. But anyway, I just, I just wanted you to be able to minister to these brothers in the fellowship today. But I am thankful they're all with us, and uh, it's just awesome to be family. Amen, church? Hey, another thing that really is exciting that we need to rejoice with is that... Uh, Sean Dobbins and Caitlin Clements have started dating. Amen. There truly is hope for everybody. Amen. Right, Sean? Amen. Good one. You know, the theme of the lesson today is a greater glory. A greater glory. You know, it seems incredible. But just uh, three and a half years ago, Elaine and I came to our first service at midweek and set up 25 chairs. And honestly, the singing was not quite as good as today. And yet to be able to see what the Lord is doing is, is incredible. It's incredible. Starting this year with 300 disciples, the Lord has blessed the, the Portland church with 104 people being baptized into Christ. 18 people being restored to Jesus Christ and over 50 people moving into the congregation from around the United States. On Sunday mornings now, we're approaching almost 600 at every service. Amen, church? I mean, God is moving. I mean, it's exciting to think we've got 51 people visiting from all over the world here today because they've heard that God is in this place. You know, it's exciting to think what God is doing in his new movement. I mean, right now in the United States, with the addition of Las Vegas, we've got 13 churches in the United States. Is that exciting? With the addition of London, Kinshasa, we've got eight churches internationally. I mean, 21 churches in just three months. Now that's cranking, amen? And yet, we, we need to have some perspective right here. We think back to the ICOC and... From 1979 to 2000, unbelievable things happen. Glorious things happen. One church in one nation with 30 disciples multiplied from one church to 400 churches. From one nation to 171 nations. From 30 would-be disciples to over 200,000 worshiping every Sunday morning. That is glorious. Amen? A greater glory? I, I don't know. I mean, Las Vegas, that's awesome. They need a church down there bad. 
But we're starting with five disciples. Los Angeles, that's great. They got, they got 23 disciples. But there was a time we worshiped in the Rose Bowl with 17,000. A greater glory. Wow. You know, for a lot of people, they've been searching their New Testaments, trying to understand this hour. And yet that's part of where we've gotten a bit off track. I do believe that the Bible has a solution and a direction and a path. No matter where a person is at, no matter where a congregation is at, no matter where a group of churches is at, God makes his will clear through his word. But often you've got to go back to the Old Testament to be able to find the parallels. And I do believe that today we can get a tremendous amount of inspiration and encouragement and direction as we'll be able to see, I believe, some parallels between what's happening now and what happened back then. I know that you all know that David reigned in about 1,000 B.C. because you learned that in First Principles, amen? And I know you'd never forget anything in First Principles. Of course... Solomon reigned in about 950 B.C. Then in 900 B.C., the kingdom divided. Yes, there was a time the kingdom divided. One part of the kingdom was led by Jeroboam. That was Israel. And the other part was led by Rehoboam. And that was Judah. So there was a time there was a divided kingdom. Over time, Israel drifted more and more and more to the point where God says, I've got to discipline you. And so Israel was exiled through the Assyrians in 722 B.C. And yet Judah also continued to drift. And so now we come to the year 606 B.C. Let's open our Bibles to 2 Chronicles chapter 36. This is the dark hour in the history of Judah. And the Bible says in verse 15 of chapter 36 of 2 Chronicles, The Lord, the God of their fathers, sent word to them through his messengers again and again, because he had pity on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked God's messengers, despised his words, and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord was aroused against his people, and there was no remedy. There was no cure. There was no solution. He brought up against them the king of the Babylonians who killed their young men with the sword in the sanctuary and spared neither young man nor young woman, old man or age. God handed all of them over to Nebuchadnezzar. He carried to Babylon all the articles from the temple of God, both large and small, and the treasure of the Lord's temple and the treasure of the kings and his officials. They set fire to God's temple and broke down the wall of Jerusalem. They burned all the palaces and destroyed everything of value there. He carried into exile to Babylon the remnant who escaped from the sword. And they became servants to him and his sons until the kingdom of Persia came to power. The land enjoyed its Sabbath rest. All the time of its desolation it rested until the 70 years were completed in fulfillment of the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm and put it into writing. This is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. Any one of his people among you, may the Lord his God be with him and let him go up. Right here, our first point is simple. God scatters and God gathers. You know, the question comes at first glance right here. Who destroyed the temple? Who destroyed Jerusalem? Who sent Judah into exile? Was it a man? Well, absolutely it was a man. It was Nebuchadnezzar. It was more than a man. Was it Satan? Absolutely anything evil comes from the deceiver of the world. But ultimately, the Bible says right here in verse 17 that God handed all of them over to Nebuchadnezzar. Ultimately, it was God 
that scattered the Jews. He destroyed Jerusalem. He destroyed Judah. Why? Because it says in verse 16, there was no remedy. Things were so bad, there was no solution. There was no cure. This had to be done. Because he loved them so much. Let's turn to the book of Nehemiah at this time. Now, Nehemiah comes along several years later after the temple is built, but the walls are still not up. They're still burnt. The gates are still not up. They're still charred. And Nehemiah just weeps when he hears this report about the remnant. And then he offers up a prayer to God that I think really gives us an insight about God's thinking at this hour. He prays in verse 8 of chapter 1. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the furthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. Wow. Right here, Nehemiah understood the principle. When God's people are unfaithful... God scatters them. But Nehemiah says, Lord, I've I got, I got to remind you of your other promise. You said that when we repent, when we become faithful, you will gather us from the furthest horizon. And you will bring us back together. See, God scatters, but God gathers. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 29. In Jeremiah 29 is the famous prophecy of Jeremiah concerning the exile. This passage was a favorite of the Portland Church in the first few weeks of our ministry to restore it. Jeremiah says in chapter 29, verse 10, This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my gracious promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope in the future. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and the places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I've carried you into exile. Does that scripture fire you up or not? You know, this scripture fired up the church here in Portland so much that when we went back through the first principle study, we said, hold it, in the Seeking God study, we have got to put this passage in there. That God has a plan to prosper us. God's plans for us are not to harm us because so often non Christians get the point and they say, My life is so dark, I have no hope. But God allows people to get to that point so they'll say, I have no place else to turn, but maybe God can help me. Sometimes Christians get to the point where they don't appreciate the blessings of salvation. And they get to the point and say, being a Christian is just too hard. And they turn back to the world. But when they start getting beaten up by Satan, when they start to see the emptiness of the world, sometimes their life gets equally as dark. And they say, there's no other place to turn. But once more they say, but maybe I can put my hope back in God. Sometimes that doesn't just happen to an individual. It can happen to a whole congregation. In fact, it happened to a whole movement. You see, right here, it's very clear that God had a plan for his people. It was a tough plan. They had to be exiled to Babylon for 70 years. And he says, hey, there is a way back. There is a way that I will will take you back. It's when you seek me with all of your heart. It's not just a matter of kind of checking things on out. 
you got to give yourself fully to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. He says, when you start doing that, then I'll gather you on in and give you a life that is just flat cranking. You know what I'm talking about right here, guys? You know, this passage came to mean a lot to Elena and myself. The Lord had used us in incredible ways in the past. And yet, because of sin in our lives, the Lord began to discipline us. Now we kept our bearings in some areas. And as a matter of fact, when things came to a head in the church that we were at in Los Angeles, and the church began to head into a more mainline theology, it just came to the point and said, well, Kip, there's no reason for you to stay. Wow. I'd pumped 12 years of my life into you. The church had grown to 10,000 disciples. 15,000 on Sunday. And to hear, there's no place for you. No salary. You're not wanted. Wow. You talk about the Lord humbling you. Was it a man? Yes. Was it Satan? Yes. But it was God. Make no mistake about your humbling. Was it a man? Yes. Was it Satan? Yes. But make no mistake, it was God. I remember driving out of Los Angeles, and everywhere I looked, there was a memory that came back to me. And, and, and literally, I just cried driving out. But Rush Yule had given me a call and said, hey, there's a church that needs a little help up there in Portland. <laughs> no, they need a lot of help. Maybe there'd even be a place for you there. I thought, Portland, Oregon. I've never even been to Portland. But you know... Quickly I saw that in the midst of my exile, God had a plan to prosper me. I found the most incredible hearted people here. Beaten up by Satan, but they were incredibly hearted. And then I began to understand that God sent me to, so to speak, a satellite church. In other words, not one of our main churches. Because often in a satellite situation... The mistakes and the sins are even more exaggerated. You know what I'm talking about? And so it was here in Portland. And God sent me here, yes, to prosper me, but also to teach me what went wrong in my life, what went wrong in the churches. And I have a deep conviction, and I I love this kind of an obscure scripture, but it's Acts 13, 36. It says, when David fulfilled the purpose of his life, he fell asleep. Now I go, that's, that's actually an awesome scripture because he had a purpose for his life until he fell asleep, until he died. And last time I checked, I was still breathing, so God has a purpose for me. And if you're breathing here today, God has a purpose for your life. Does that fire you on up? What did I learn about myself? What did I learn about the movement? First of all, I saw that my heart had drifted from God. That ultimately... The the reason that the Lord scattered the churches was our hearts. We weren't preaching grace the way we needed to. We didn't give grace and mercy. We didn't minister to the weak. We lost our idealism for unity. We gave in and said, well, yeah, maybe brothers can't get along. And that... Crack just went all the way through the churches. And then the temptation came to return to our roots, the mainline church of Christ. You know, whenever someone does lousy spiritually, they always go back to their roots. A lot of people say, well, I'm going to go back to my physical family because they've lost confidence in their spiritual family. I'm going to go back to my early theology because they've lost confidence in their present theology. And that's what happened. That's what happened. And as the Lord began to teach me, I found myself healing. And of course, as we announced just a few weeks ago, Elena and myself, we really believe the Holy Spirit is sending us and a mission team down to Los Angeles, to the new little church down here, Los Angeles International Christian Church. 
And I know there's some healing there because the places that I went by when I came on up here that I looked at and I, and I had a memory from, I didn't cry anymore. I go, yeah, Amen. that's where I studied with him and he became a Christian. Yeah. yeah, that's where my daughter got baptized. That, And you know something? You know you're starting to heal up when you're no longer mourning. And you got to understand what mourning is. It's just flat old self-pity. And when you don't deal with self-pity, that leads to bitterness and resentment. And that drives you even further away from God. And all you see are the sins of men. And you do not see the hand of God. You need to come to a deep conviction that our God is a sovereign God. He scatters. But when we return to him with all of our heart, he gathers. That's the promise from the word of God. Point two. God proves and God moves. You know, in the midst of all the tribulation in our congregations, and perhaps in the midst of the tribulation of your own life, many of us lost sight of God. And even, is is God even out there? Does God even care? Are my sacrifices worth it? And of course, that was part of the problem, is that we had our eyes on ourselves and not on our God. Let's go to the book of Daniel, and let's see if we can understand That God proves and God moves. We're going to go through several scriptures today. You may not be able to get to all of them. Write them down. Check them out. We have a deep conviction here at the Portland Church that, hey, if we teach or preach something that's not in the Word of God, then just forget it. But if it's in the Word of God, it's not some graying, old Champion basketball player that is preaching the word of God. This is the word of God. Are you with me right here? Let's get over to the book of Daniel. In Daniel chapter 1, verses 1 through 6, we find that Nebuchadnezzar brings back amongst the exiles to Babylon Daniel himself. In chapter 2, we find that Nebuchadnezzar has this dream. About the kingdom. In chapter 3, of course, is the story of Daniel's friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, being tossed into the fiery furnace and then being with Jesus. And then we find a very interesting passage right here in chapter 5, verse 1. King Belshazzar gave a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles and drank wine with them. While Belshazzar was drinking his wine, he gave orders to bring the gold and silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem so that the king and his nobles, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. Well, right here we see that Nebuchadnezzar has died and the kingdom has passed to his son, Belshazzar. Now, he doesn't last very long because he does not humble himself before God like his father, Nebuchadnezzar, did. And so we read then in verse 30 these words. That very night... Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain, and Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. Now, this is interesting because, of course, we talk about the Medo-Persian Empire. And, of course, Darius the Mede, of course, initiates this particular chapter of secular history. So, we find that Nebuchadnezzar reigns during the time of Daniel in captivity. Then, Belshazzar reigns, and Daniel's in captivity. Now Darius reigns, and of course it's during Darius' reign that Daniel's in the lion's den. Now go to chapter 10. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a revelation was given to Daniel. Oh, wow. Now we understand that Daniel lived not only through Darius' reign, which is quite short, but into the life of Cyrus. Then going back to 2 Chronicles, we remember that after the 70 years were up, God raised up Cyrus, and in his first year, he called the Jews to go back to Jerusalem. Are you with me right there, guys? Now, what do we learn from this? Something that's very important. A lot of individuals, I think, have really misunderstood where we're at in God's new movement. I really believe with all of my heart that God is moving and pulling us together. 
that God is gathering us as individuals come and say, listen, I want to seek the Lord with all of my heart. He's promised to gather us again. Amen? But we need to understand that Daniel was not amongst the Jews that went back to Jerusalem. He did not go back. Because in this third year right here, it says right here, he's still in Babylon. What does that teach us? It teaches us that there are saved people outside of the remnant that's regathering together. And that's very, very important for us to understand. I think some people have really misunderstood. They say, oh, the only saved people are the people in this new movement. No, 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 no. We're trying to get others to come and join us. Are you with me right there, guys? But we got to admit, hey, Daniel will see up in heaven. Are you with me right here? But he was not a part of the remnant that went back to Jerusalem. Now, let's go to Ezra. I hope you guys are not having to look at the front of your Bibles to get to these places. Otherwise, first principles for you. (laughs) In Ezra chapter 1, we read a reiteration, to some degree, of 2 Chronicles chapter 36. Now we understand that in 606 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar came into Jerusalem and destroyed the temple and all Jerusalem and brought back the exiles into Babylon. Seventy years later, in 536, Cyrus begins to reign. And so we read in verse 1, chapter 1 of Ezra. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm and to put it in writing. This is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. Any one of his people among you, may his God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem and Judah and build the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem. And the people of any place where survivors may now be living are to provide him with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, and with free will offerings for the temple of God in Jerusalem. Then the heads of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and Levites, everyone whose heart God had moved, prepared to go up and build the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. Is that exciting or not? You see, right here, we see that God proves himself. Isn't it amazing? I mean, doesn't this blow you away? That this Jeremiah, wild man of a prophet, says, listen, don't take a stand against Nebuchadnezzar. Just go with the flow. Just go back and in captivity. Man, that doesn't sound like a prophet. I mean, all the other prophets are saying, hey, take a stand against these evil kings. But Jeremiah says, no, it is God's will to discipline us and you're to go back in exile. And he says, in 70 years, you will be in captivity. And then in 70 years, as you return your hearts to seek him with all of your heart, God will bring you back from captivity. Is that exciting? Now, look what God has to do right here. He has to kill off Darius at just the right year. He says, Darius, you're about 66, time for you to go. I'm going to raise up Cyrus to be the new leader of the Medo-Persian Empire. Now, that's cranking timing, don't you admit? In the very first year, Cyrus does something that's historically documented. He does something not only for the Jews, but this is historically documented. He does this for all the conquered people, which made him very special. With all the conquered people, he says, hey, you can go back and worship Your own gods. You do not have to worship the God of the Medes or the Babylonians. And so with the Jews in particular, he says, hey, you can go back to Jerusalem and rebuild your temple and worship God again in that place. Now, it's amazing that in exactly 70 years, God moves in the first year of Cyrus's reign. He moves his heart and he makes this decree. Is that cranking? Does that make you trust the word of God? You know, it wasn't at 68 years. It wasn't at 74 years. Smack dab at 70. God proves his word is true. Amen, guys? He proves his word is true by moving in the heart of men. 
he not only moves in his people, but he moved in Cyrus, a very evil king. And yet the Bible says right here in verse 5, he says, Then the family heads of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and Levites, everyone whose heart God had moved, prepared to go up and build the house. You see, this was God's new movement. Are you with me right here? God was moving in these people. What was the condition? They had to seek God with all of their heart. And now they had to prepare to go up. You know, anytime you come back to God, it, it's not an easy path. As a matter of fact, physically speaking, to go up Jerusalem, Jerusalem is located about a mile up in the mountains. And you literally have to go up. And so when you come back to God, it is like you have to go up the mountain. Now, you know what I'm talking about right here? And this is why a lot of people don't want to do it. It's just, it's, they have to go up. It requires pain. It's tough to do. But it says, I want to move in your hearts. You need to prepare to go up and build the house of the Lord. You know, it's, it's amazing to me the way that God is moving. I mean, here today we've got over 50 people that have come from all around the world just to come and worship God. It's amazing to me that many of the people that are, that are now saying, Hold on, I want to be a part of, of a sold-out church where, where people are being called to be disciples, where the discipling is going on, where people are seeking God with all of their heart, unapologetically. On, Most of these people I didn't even know. <laughs> I never met. So what's bringing us together? It's God moving in our hearts. Are you with me right here? It is undeniable that God is moving at this hour. And we need to be sure about that. You know, it's kind of sad to me that some people kind of blow off all the things that are going on as church politics. And they try to make fun of it or belittle it. Let me tell you something. The salvation of the world is on the line. And perhaps your own salvation is on the line. We need to understand biblically what is going on. You see, without question, the remnant has done so much for this church. I mean, the people that have moved to Portland, let me tell you something. You've really got to go up the mountain to get here. It's not like this is a city filled with job opportunities. It's not like this is a place people go, oh, man, the weather there is just awesome. You know, the people that decide to move here are amazing. They say, listen, it's not happening where I'm at. And time after time, people say, wow, I'm finally back at the church I was baptized into. This is, this is not by chance. God is drawing us together. God is gathering a new movement so that we can go out into the nations and evangelize it in this generation. Are you with me right here? Our third point. God measures our treasure. God measures our treasure. You know the scripture in Matthew 6, 21. Where your heart is, there your treasure is also. Where your heart is, there your treasure is also. Let's continue on in Ezra. God has moved in the heart of these peoples to go out of Babylon and go back to Jerusalem as the remnant. And so we read in chapter 2, verse 68, these words. When they arrived at the house of the Lord in Jerusalem, some of the heads of the families gave free will offerings towards the rebuilding of the house of God on its site. This is kind of incredible. You know, the Portland church never has been a very rich church. The sad part, there was a time right before we came where the church here stopped even taking a contribution. The people had lost all confidence in the human leadership and said, I'm not going to give my money. And you know how that's true. You don't give your money to something you don't believe in. Now, of course, they'd lost sight that giving the money isn't giving it to the church. It's giving it to God. And like the Portland church taught me, when you're doing lousy spiritually, you become man-focused, not God-focused. And so people say, I'm not going to give my money to those people. See what I'm talking about? And so they quit giving. Now, interestingly, here in this remnant that's coming back to Jerusalem, they're not only moving their whole family and everything, 
But when they get there in order to build the house of the Lord, the Bible says they gave a free will offering. Nobody told them to do it. It wasn't a special occasion to say, man, we need some money in order to get this thing built. You know what was amazing? In our early days, we didn't have very much money here in the Portland church, but several of the couples that moved here, without anybody talking to them, took a tenth of the profit on the houses they sold. And gave it to the church as a free will offering because they wanted to build the house of the Lord. Is that awesome? Let's keep moving on right here. In chapter 3, in verse 8, we read these words. In the second month of the second year. Okay, so now we got to figure out what the date is. Second month, second year. So this must be 535 B.C. Amen? In the second month of the second year, after arrival at the house of God in Jerusalem, Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel. Now, Zerubbabel is in the line of David. Jeshua, son of Jehozadak, he is the high priest. And the rest of their brothers, the priests and the Levites, and all of us who had returned from captivity to Jerusalem, began the work appointing Levites 20 years of age and older to supervise the building of the house of the Lord. Verse 10. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments and with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals, took their places to praise the Lord, as prescribed by David, king of Israel. With praise and thanksgiving, they sang to the Lord. He's good. His love to Israel endures forever. They just broke out in song. They were so fired up. And all the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the older priests and Levites and family heads who had seen the former temple wept aloud when they saw the foundation of this temple being laid while many others shouted for joy. No one could distinguish the sound of the sounds of joy from the sounds of weeping because the people made so much noise and the sound was heard far away. Is this incredible? Here they've all pitched in their money. They've come to rebuild the house of the Lord. They've laid the foundation. I mean, people are just fired up. They're shouting. I mean, it's an incredible noise. But some of the older brothers and sisters, they were crying. They were crying. Why? Well, I think it's obvious. What a heartbreaking thing to have to build a second foundation. They had seen the original temple. This, this new temple was not built by rich Jews like Solomon. The original temple was, so to speak, baptized in gold. It was incredible. And now this new temple just wasn't at all measuring up, let alone they had to build a new temple. You know, without question, there's a lot of the young people taking our congregation. They're on fire. Going, Amen. We have a new movement. This is cranking. We're going to go all over the world. But then we've got some older members that remember the old temple. And it even hurts for them to think we've got to lay a new foundation. And it even hurts to think, oh, man, if we've got to lay a new foundation, oh, my gosh, we're going to have to do this thing all over again. And the price I paid. Oh my goodness. And it takes them aback. And then they weep for those that haven't joined them in building the new foundation. We don't have the same amount of money. We don't have the same amount of people. And there's a weeping and there's a sadness that's there. Interestingly, in chapter 4. When the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard the exiles were building a temple for the Lord, the God of Israel, they came to Zerubbabel, to the heads of his family, and said, Let us help you build, because like you, we seek your God, and have been sacrificing him since the time of Esheradon, the king of Assyria, who brought us here. But Zerubbabel, Jeshua, and the rest of the heads of the family of Israel answered, You have no part with us in building the temple of the Lord our God. We alone will build it to the Lord, the God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, commanded us. Then the peoples around them set out to discourage the people of Judah and make them afraid to go on building. They hired counselors to work against them and frustrate their plans during the entire reign of Cyrus, king of Persia, and down to the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Man, when they started rebuilding the foundation, that's when they started getting persecuted. When they were starting to build something new, 
That's when people who said they loved God began to try to discourage them and frustrate their plans. Interestingly, look at, look at verse 5. They even hired counselors to work against them. When I mean, we think it's all new, these exit counselors, you know, that try to take away the young people, you know, and get their parents pay tons of money to get them out of that cult. Hey, nothing's new under the sun. They were doing it back in that movement too. But we need to understand, I mean, people today are afraid. Oh, we're starting a new church. Isn't that wrong? I'm telling you, there are lots of disciples that are thoroughly confused over this singular issue. And part of the problem is they don't really see where the situation's at. They really honestly don't see it. Now, we, we've got to have the right heart right here, guys. We've got to say, hold it. We've got to keep those bridges up. Now, people may try to put walls and barriers to us, to them, but we cannot do that because we want as many people as God moves to join us. Are you with me right here, guys? Amen. You know what's sad is we read on in verse 24. Thus the work on the house of God in Jerusalem came to a standstill until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Do you realize that the persecution was so strong against the Jews that they actually stopped building the temple? They did it. Don't, don't tell me, oh, persecution never stopped church. Let me tell you something. When disciples start being worried about persecution, it absolutely can stop the church. Fear and cowardice will stop people dead in their tracks. Now look at this, verse 5. Chapter 5. Now Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the prophet. Well, that's cool. Now we know when those guys were preaching the word. Now Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the prophet, a descendant of Ido, prophesied to the Jews in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of God of Israel who was over them. Then Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, son of Jehoshadak, set to work to rebuild the house of God in Jerusalem. And the prophets of God were with them, helping them build. Now this is pretty cool. Because right here is another dilemma that so many people in our churches are wrestling with. They say, well, we don't want a man leading our movement. Let me tell you something. I don't want a man leading our movement either. But we still need leaders who follow God so that people can be led to God. Look at the passage right here. It's it's talking about Haggai, talking about Zechariah, and it says, in the name of the God of Israel who was over them. See, these people understood it was God that was leading them. It was God behind the rebuilding of the temple. But they needed human leadership. Now, part of the things that went wrong in our fellowship is that we began to idolize our leaders. And so consequently, that really messed a lot of people up. But on the other hand, the backlash, the pendulum swing on that was just to get rid of all leaders. To get rid of all structure. And, of course, that led to oblivion. See, we've got to strike the balance of the scriptures to understand that we want to be in a movement that God is leading. But we've got to be comfortable that God uses men to lead us to him. Amen, guys? Well, let's go on over to the book of Haggai. If we know that Haggai's preaching, let's find out what this guy had to say. In verse 1 of Haggai, in the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Haggai, to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehoshaphat, the high priest. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say the time has not yet come for the Lord's house to be built. Then the word of the Lord came to the prophet Haggai. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin? Okay, so now let's, let's figure this out right here. A lot of people are confused by the very first verse. It says, in the second year of King Darius. And a lot of people go, well, oh, I thought Darius was, we had, like, didn't we just have Nebuchadnezzar and then Belshazzar and then Darius? Wrong Darius. That was Darius the Mede. This guy is historically called Darius Histaphes. He reigned in Persia from 521 B.C. 
to 486 B.C. And so now we have a time marker right here. In the second year of King Darius. So what year are we at? 520 B.C. The work of the Lord has stopped. Why? Because of the persecution? Yes. But what had it done to the followers of God? They're starting to say, well, it's just not time to build a new house. It's just not time to plant new churches. But what's the issue? And Haggai confronts it. He says, is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin? See, what's happened is so many people out there that were faithful, hardline disciples is they say, listen, I can't put my time and my energy and my talents into building the church around the world because it's not moving anymore. As a matter of fact, was it even worth what I did? And so what have they done? They've begun to panel their houses. They've begun to, their life is just so full, they don't have any time for church. Well, they have time for the new church that meets only on Sunday morning and Wednesday night. They've gotten away from being a disciple 24-7. See, the same thing happened. When they stopped building, then the people started to want to build their own lives. And when they started building their own lives, they were kind of trapped by all the deceitfulness of will, by the worries of this life and the desire for other things. Jesus says, that is what makes you unfruitful. Are oh, you with me here, church? Go down to chapter 2, verse 1. On the 21st day of the seventh month, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Haggai. Speak to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehoshaphat, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people. Ask them, who of you is left who saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Does it not seem to you like nothing? Wow. Probably there wasn't anybody left that had seen the original temple, but the story was there. I mean, even now, if you read about Solomon's temple, you go, wow, that is awesome. And they remembered that awesomeness. And they said, now, look what we got. How does it look to you now? Does it not seem to you like nothing? Verse 4. Now be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehoshaphat, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord, and work. <laughs> Notice that. <laughs> be strong. That's not just, I'm going to have my quiet time today. No. Be strong and work. Build the house of the Lord. For I am with you. There's the promise of the Great Commission. Amen. I am with you, declares the Lord Almighty. This is what I coveted with you when you came out of Egypt. And my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while, I'll once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations, and the desired of the nations will come. And I will fill this house with glory. The desired of the nations are the faithful people of God. He's talking about filling this house, the temple, with those people. And that is God's glory, says the Lord Almighty. Look at this, verse 8. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house. He says, you think Solomon's temple was cranking? This new temple is going to be even more glorious. But people are going, well, I see the temple. It just doesn't, it doesn't seem like it's baptized in gold. He says, listen. Here's what this is all about. I am going to go into the nations and everyone that dares seek me with all of his heart, I'm going to bring together. And that'll be my glory in the temple. And it'll be far more glorious than the first temple. See, the amazing thing is, he says right here in verse 8, the silver's mine. The gold is mine. Hey, if I wanted, I could give you guys a bunch of gold, a bunch of silver, and you could coat it down with gold and silver. That's not what I'm about. I want you to see that what I'm about is my glory. What I'm about is having your heart. That's what I'm all about. You know, it's, uh, it's interesting. Zechariah also spoke to this same issue. Turn to Zechariah chapter 8. 
This prophecy, we know, takes place in 517 B.C. from Zechariah chapter 7, verse 1. But I want to pick up the reading in verse 20 of chapter 8. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Many peoples and the inhabitants of many cities will yet come. And the inhabitants of one city will go to another and say, Let us go at once to entreat the Lord and seek the Lord Almighty. I myself am going. And many peoples and powerful nations will come to Jerusalem to seek the Lord Almighty and to entreat Him. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In those days, ten men from all languages and nations will take firm hold of one Jew by the hem of his robe and say, Let us go with you, because we have heard that God is with you. Does that fire you on up right there? You see, right here, the prophecy has a couple different levels. For the Jew that heard this prophecy, it was just flat awesome to think that people were being drawn from all different nations from the Medo-Persian Empire back to Jerusalem. Can you imagine as each Jewish family came back on in, how awesome that would be? But they came back to Jerusalem to seek the Lord with all of their heart. For the second level of this prophecy, it was much more about not the Jewish nation per se, but about Christianity itself. That God's new house, Christianity, would be for all the nations. Of course, the mystery of the gospel was that the Gentiles would join the Jews in the worship and the glorification of God. Amen, guys? But I think for us, it still has another level of interpretation. I believe that God is a God of ever-increasing glory. And there were awesome things that were done from 79 to 2000. That's incredible. But it's obvious for the people that literally have come from all over the world, in some ways there is no remedy. Now we're not saying there aren't disciples in many of these churches. Not many great disciples. There are. But on the other hand, God is gathering. God is moving. And when God is moving, he moves our hearts to come together and to start a new movement that can go to all the nations. Are you with me right here? So that the glory of this new movement will be even greater than the former movement. Are you with me here? You know, I, I, think, I think it's just flat incredible that people like to try and say, okay, we're starting a new church in Las Vegas with five people. That is glorious. I think it's incredible they take 30 people and they start the Chicago church or 30 in Phoenix because these churches are dedicated to making disciples who make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. We will fill these cities with the teachings of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. But one thing we need to be sure about right here is what we're all about. I think one of the greatest testimonies of what we're all about took place in little Hilo, Hawaii. And you know the story. I mean, it's incredible. Here's this church where at Zenith had about 60 disciples. They were having about 80 to 100 on Sundays. Over time, during the Great Tribulation, it trickles down to about 35 people. That included the kids on Sunday morning service at about 10 to 15 at midweek. Kyle becomes, Kyle Bartholomew becomes the ministry. He says, man, I want to check out what's happening in Portland. I hear a lot of bad, but I hear some good. I have hope. He comes to Jubilee and he goes, man, I want this back in Hilo. So he goes back, gets the leaders together says, hey, we want Kip and Elena to come on over, disciple the church, rebuild the foundation of disciples, of sold out disciples. So we come on over there in mid-September. We preach the word. At the end of three days, we got 12 disciples left. Now, a lot of people say, what can 12 disciples do? Well, you need, that's when you need to get your New Testament out and find out what 12 disciples can do. They can turn the world upside down for Jesus Christ. Amen, guys? Now, Kyle, I love with all of my heart. And he's a pretty good basketball player, amen? But the, the, he doesn't really have much training. But here's a man that is calling people through the word of God to be sold out disciples, to return to the Lord with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. They started with 12 disciples at the end of September. In three months' time, they've seen eight people baptized into Christ. Does that fire you on up right there? Let me, let me just come in for a landing. How are we doing here in Portland? 
How's your Bible talk of 12 or your house church of 12 doing? Or have you let some lukewarmness sneak on in there? Because you're in the great Portland church. See, that's what faked us out. We're in this great movement of God. And yet our hearts individually drifted away from God. You know, there, there are a lot of challenges that we're, we're going to have to really take up at this hour. One of the big challenges that I really believe is that we have got to remain a beacon of light by preaching the word. And not backing down. You know, a lot of people say, oh, unwholesome talk. When you're saying that the churches are lukewarm, look at the churches. That's not unwholesome talk. That's preaching the word. And the Bible says right here that one person is going to go to another city and say, hey, come with me. Come with me to Jerusalem and let's seek the Lord together. I'm going on up there and I hear there are a lot of other people from other nations coming. You know, we've got to understand, when you get fired up about God, you're going to want other people to be fired up about God. We understand that from an evangelism point of view. But do we understand it from a remnant point of view? Yes, God is collecting the remnant, but we are God's servants. You know, if you had a son or daughter in a lukewarm church, you wouldn't go, well, I just want them to stay in that lukewarm church. I don't want to say anything. I don't want to recruit them. Let me tell you something. If you got your boy in there, if you got your daughter in there, you're going to say, hey, boy, come with me and see the seal of God. You got to come. Because you see that the challenge of lukewarmness is people don't even know they are lukewarm. We've got to be like these people of the prophecy. People that go from one city to another city to another city say, hey, come with me. You got to come see the Lord. People are coming from all nations. We cannot be ashamed to be a part of the Lord working in people's lives to collect a remnant that's going to evangelize the world. Are you with me right here? You know, it's really amazing what's happened because a lot of the people that have moved to Portland have really made Portland. I think of Greg and Carol Goman. I mean, what, where would we be at without the Goman family? I mean, they have inspired the Lazarus ministry. In the meantime... Two of the kids have gotten baptized into Jesus Christ. Amen? It's exciting to be able to see what's happening. Uh, in a couple of weeks, we're going to be sending out Jonathan Green and Alan Dalsam over to Brisbane, Australia. Now, Alan was baptized here in Portland, but Jonathan moved here with his family. He's part of the collecting of the remnant. You know, when Ted and, and Kathy came, they said, hold it we got to have all of our boys. And so I say, hey, Jonathan, you got to come to Portland. He was in Florida. You're giving up Florida. But now, here's a remnant person, here's a Portland person, and now they're going to Australia to preach the word with the Willis's. Is that flat awesome or not? Here are the challenges for us. Number one, rededicate yourself to God and his dream of world evangelism. For some of us, we're still in the turkey coma. Today is the day to repent and to turn our hearts back to God. For others of us, hey, our hearts have not been with God 100%. You need to take time today or tomorrow, and you need to get right with God and seek God with all of your heart. Amen? Number two, we need to embrace the moment and the remnant. It's not time to be sad anymore. It's time to be excited. A new movement is starting. There's new hope for the cities. There's new hope for the states. There's new hope for the world. Let's get some other people and say, hey, come and see God. Number three, we need to make the ideal the standard. We need to call ourselves to be sold out disciples. And we need to be sure that all the disciples around us are sold out disciples. Because let's just face it, guys. You don't always stay a sold out disciple. All of our hearts slip some. You know what I'm talking about? Now, we need to do it with a lot more mercy than we did in the olden days. But that doesn't mean we back off. We still need discipling. We still need one another. Are you with me right there? Number four. Now we need to focus on making disciples. I'm going to speak directly to the Portland church right here. Part of the Portland church is on a mission team down to Los Angeles. Your heart should not drift to Los Angeles right now. We need to preach the word and make disciples. Those of us here in Portland, it's not time for mourning. Hey, we're all going to be together. We don't believe in autonomy. We all are one church. Amen, guys. 
But we got to start making disciples. We got to bring your neighbor day coming up at the end of this month. Let's go out and preach the word and make the people come on in. Are you with me right here? Number five, we need to attend to the contribution on a weekly basis and in our special contribution. Whatever we pledge, let's give. If we need to make up our contribution, let's make it up. In our special, we have a goal of $150,000. That's what it's going to take to send the L.A. team on out. you got to get behind that. you got to believe in that. What does that come down to? Well, on an average basis, it's about 12 times. But some of us have got to sacrifice to make this become a reality. Number six, never be ashamed of being partners in the Gospels. You know, you hear about these struggling little churches coming on out. Take a stand. Don't be ambivalent. Don't be neutral about these new churches. They're your brothers and your sisters, and be proud of them. Are you with me right here? And number seven, bottom line, take it higher. Make 2007 the greatest year of your Christian life. Stop talking about your college years as those were the awesome days. Stop talking about your 20s. Start talking about now. Now is the glory of the Lord. A greater glory can be held at this hour in your personal life. 